Uh, welcome to the Fettuccine Forum. Thank you so much for being here this evening. Uh, my name is Travis Jeffries. I'm the History Programs Manager with the Boise City Department of Arts and History. Uh, before we begin, I'd like to acknowledge the ancestral, cultural, traditional, and unceded territory of the Shoshone, Bannock, and Northern Paiute peoples here in the Boise Valley. A couple of housekeeping items before we get started. I just want to gently remind everyone that this evening's program is being recorded, and we'll make that recording available uh, to you in the coming days. Uh, this is a hybrid event, meaning that it's both in person, obviously, and online via Zoom. And we'll have a moderated Q&A at the end, so please hold your questions. Uh, till that time, give our distinguished guests an opportunity to get through his presentation, and then we'll have some Q&A. Uh, if you're here in the audience, you'll see that you have pencil and paper in front of you. Uh, please write your questions down, and then we'll come around at the end, and we'll collect those for that moderated Q&A. And if you're joining online, please send your questions uh, through the Zoom applications uh, Q&A feature. Uh, there are auto-generated captions that we have. You can view those by clicking on the live transcript button at the bottom of the screen and then selecting show subtitles. So the Fettuccine Forum, as many of you know, has been a fixture on Boise's cultural landscape for a long time. We're very excited to be bringing you the 19th uh, edition, the 19th year of the Fettuccine Forum. The forum's possible with support from the Office of the Mayor, Boise State Public Radio, uh, the Department of History at Boise State University, and of course, all of you. If you like programming such as the forum, please consider a donation to the History Division's Heritage Fund. You can find out more on our website, boiseartsandhistory.org, or you can contribute uh, to the Boise Arts and History Foundation at boiseartsandhistoryfoundation.org. I'd like to point out once again that our friends from Meriwether Cider are here, uh, so we encourage you uh, to support local business. We want to thank them for being here and offering their services. Uh, I also want to mention again that our guest, Mr. Perry, will have books for sale at the table in the corner, uh, and if you're nice enough, he, he might even sign them for you. So this is the second installment of the Fettuccine Forum this year. Uh, it's a four-part series, and we're exploring histories, historical narratives that have been overshadowed, overlooked, potentially even purposefully erased from historical memory. And I think it's important to point out that these are stories, these are histories that have always existed, uh, but that maybe haven't enjoyed the pride of place uh, of the dominant histories, right? So at the city of Boise and within the Department of Arts and History, we're committed to diversity, equity, and inclusion. So we seek to tell stories and to facilitate the telling of stories through uh, various lenses and from multiple perspectives. Uh, and I'll also point out that, you know, within the historical profession, there's an increasing awareness of that dominance, right? The dominance of narratives, um, the dominance that the, the um, hegemonic culture has told history through its own lenses for a very long time. And this has served to sort of muffle other voices. It's drowned out potentially other stories. And this is just as true in Idaho as in other parts of the country and even the world, and perhaps even truer in our home state. And that's why we've organized this forum. And that's why we think that the theme of this forum is very, very timely, very important, and is called From the Margins to the Center of History in Idaho and the West. And through this theme, we hope to amplify those stories um, that have always existed once again, but maybe haven't received the traction that they deserve. And of course, we seek to elevate the voices of those who have always told their stories, their histories in their own traditions, uh, but which may have been silenced or rendered less audible uh, by those of the dominant culture. So there are four installments in this year's forum. Uh, there's three remaining, including tonight. On October 6th, we had the privilege of hearing from Boise's own Professor William White, what did archeology span at the Irma Heyman House tell Boise, Idaho? Uh, we encourage you to check out the recording online on our website. And of course, we encourage you to come down and visit the city of Boise's newest cultural site, the Irma Heyman House located at 617 Ash Street in Boise's River Street District. We'll take a couple of months hiatus for the holidays after tonight's program and we'll return on February 2nd uh, for Out in Idaho, Queer Spaces Beyond Boise featuring Professor Lisa McLean and graduate student Rachel Taylor of BSU. On March 2nd, we'll hear traditional Chinese medicine in Idaho and the American West, a history of herbs and roots featuring Professor Tamara Bennett Shelton of Claremont McKenna College. And of course, tonight we have history, healing and restoration featuring Darren Perry. 
I now have the pleasure of introducing our speaker tonight, Darren Perry. He's the former chairman of the Northwestern Band of the Shoshone Nation. Darren serves on the board of directors for the American West Heritage Center in Wellsville, Utah, the Utah Humanities Board, and the PBS Utah Board of Directors. He attended the University of Utah and Weber State and received his bachelor's degree in secondary education with an emphasis on history. Darren is the author of The Bear River Massacre, a Shoshone history, and teaches Native American history at Utah State. His passions in life are his wife, Melody, his seven children, and his 17 grandchildren. His other passion is his tribal family. He wants to make sure that those who have gone before him have not been forgotten. I'm now pleased to stop talking and turn our time over to Mr. Perry. Thank you. Can you hear me okay? I do these a lot and you will always wonder if people are gonna show up. So thank you for showing up to one of my most favorite towns that I've spoken at, really. My wife and I were in Copenhagen, Denmark. I gave a lecture at the University of Copenhagen three weeks ago and this excites me way more than that did. <laughs> although that was a pretty cool trip. I want you to know that American history for a long time was written and taught as a single American story. It was a narrative of nation building that united its participants into this one single story. It was a national success story celebrating human triumphs made possible in a society based on principles of liberty, and equality and justice for all, or so we thought. I'm still patiently waiting for the justice for all part. In years past, historians have sometimes ignored or dismissed peoples whose experiences didn't conform to this master narrative. Often left out were the experiences of the American Indian. After all, our story is one of decline and suffering rather than one of progress and happiness. But times change and the history and the stories that we tell about the past changes too. I have come to realize over a lifetime that when you reduce history to just data and when you remove the storytelling or the emotional side, we lose some of the humanity that makes history so important. But I believe that's why our story, the Shoshone story is so important. If you were to drive today along Highway 91, just past Preston, Idaho, you'll round a curve that opens to a beautiful panoramic view of the Bear River bottomlands below. On a cold winter day, if you know where to look, you can still see the steam rising from its edges. 158 years ago, it was at that exact spot that some 700 members of the Shoshone Nation were wintering, as they had done for centuries. Nearby hot springs provided a welcome place to catch their breath catch up with family and friends during the cold winter months. We called this place Moso de Guani, which means home of the lungs. A half a mile to the east, Colonel Patrick Edward Connor and his 220 cavalry, California volunteers from Camp Douglas, Utah, had the same bird's eye view on that cold January morning. When something terrible happens, where human lives are lost, that place always seems to take on a new meaning. Think about it, the 14.6 acres of the World Trade Centers, the beaches of Normandy, a homemade memorial at the side of the road where a fatal traffic accident occurred. Places that haunt and hurt, for the wounds that they hold. But for some reason, they still compel us to go back. 
for some unexplainable comfort. Have you ever had a memory sneak out of your eye and roll down your cheek? I have that all the time when I think about the massacre of my people. For thousands of years, tribal elders would sit down with the children and tell them stories. The stories were always the same. There was never a word out of place. It had to be that way. It had to be accurate. Our children needed to hear the stories as the elders had heard the stories because in our culture, nothing was ever written down. I went through that same process with my grandmother. Her name was Mae Timbimbu Perry. She would sit for hours and tell me stories about how the coyote stole fire or how the bald eagle became bald. And then with reverence in her tone and sometimes a tear in her eye, she would relate the story of the massacre at Bo Ogai. There's an old Indian saying that I love that says, when an old Indian dies, a library burns. And that was never as true as it was about my grandmother. Because of her, as I grew older, when I attended school, I developed this great love for history. And then one day, sitting in history class, I suddenly realized something. None of the stories that my grandmother told me are in her history books. How could that be? I had always believed that historical events were an absolute. I believed that events that transpired over time had one conclusion. But as I've gotten older and wiser, I hope, I've come to realize that history is about perspective. Whose perspective? And then one day I read a quote that was attributed to the great English leader, Winston Churchill. And he said that history is only written, and may I add, memorialized by the victors. I guess that explains then to me why Native American histories are never written. In the summer of 1847, Sagwitch, our chief, who happens to be my great, great, great grandfather, he received word from a network of tribes that there was a group of white settlers making their way through Wyoming to, and headed towards the Salt Lake Valley. And on July 31st in 1847, Sagwitch greeted Brigham Young and the first group of pioneers. He didn't meet with Brigham Young that day because of his illness. He instead met with a man named Heber C. Kimball. At the conclusion of that meeting, Heber C. Kimball said this, you do not own the land. The lands belong to our heavenly father and we calculate to plow and plant it. If you can imagine disputes within months arose between the pioneers and my people over the land and what my grandmother said, the payment of rent. Sagwich's life was now going to be complicated. Over the next few years, as more and more saints arrived to that valley, good lands was now becoming scarce. In 1856, Brigham Young sent scouts north, where I live today in the Cache Valley, and they discovered that valley for the first time. In those early days, that first group of settlers to the Cache Valley referred to Sagwich and his people as the friendly ones. As more and more saints arrived to that valley in the next couple of years, those same saints described us as thieves and beggars which was probably true from their perspective. The irony though, in that for me, is that the Latter-day Saints themselves had suffered so much hate and injustice as they made their trek across his country. It's hard for me to believe that they could be found guilty of doing the same thing to my people. Peter Mon, who was now the area authority for the Saints in the Cache Valley said this, he said, with extraordinarily good luck, 
the California volunteers will completely wipe them out. He went on to say, we wish this community rid of all such parties. And if Connor can be successful in reaching that bastard class of humans who play with the lives of the peaceable and the law abiding citizens in this way, we shall be pleased to acknowledge our obligations. With that development, the use of the California and Oregon trails that cut through the heart of Shoshone land. I looked at it as our people had three options, beg for food, starve, or steal. Two different groups of people living two different lifestyles. In early January of 1863, the saints from Cache Valley and those using the California Oregon trails began writing letters to Salt Lake City for someone to come take care of the Indian depredations. Arrest warrants were issued by a federal judge in Salt Lake for Chiefs Pocatello, Bear Hunter, and Sagwich. Colonel Patrick Edward Connor and his California volunteers from Camp Douglas, Utah were now mustered into service. A Mormon scout named Porter Rockwell led Connor and his troops just north of where I live today in Logan, near Preston, Idaho, where Battle Creek meets Bal Ogai, or what you call the Bear River. Sagwich, being an early riser, got up as usual on the morning of that January 29th. He left his teepee and surveyed the area around his camp. He noticed that the hills to the southeast appeared to be covered in a steaming mist. He didn't know what it was, and then the mist started creeping down the hill. And then he realized what he could see was the 220 horses that had been traveling all night in four feet of snow. It was zero degrees. The horses were steaming. Every time they'd take a breath, the steam would rise. He suddenly realized what was taking place. He woke up his village told them prepare themselves for battle. My grandmother said some of the women picked up their woven winnowing pans to use them for shields. Without so much as asking for any of the guilty men, Connor and his men began to fire upon the Shoshone people. But what are arrows compared to the rifles and sidearms of the soldiers? The soldiers massacred men, women, and children. My grandmother said our people were being slaughtered like wild rabbits. The massacre started early in the morning and lasted until early afternoon. The Bear River, which was slightly frozen earlier, was now starting to flow. Many of the people were jumping into the river to try to escape. The blazing white snow was now brilliant red with blood. The willows that were used as hiding places were now bent down as if in defeat. Many of our women were running with their children to try to escape and most all of them died. There was one woman named Angie Chi. She was a brand new mom. She was young. She told of jumping into the river. You might ask yourself, how could they jump into this river and survive? We camped there because of the many hot springs that are along the edge of the river. Angie Chi jumped into the river with her newborn. She swam under an overhanging bank where she could find refuge. When she got there, she found herself there with 10 other women who would have the same idea. They could hear the soldiers on the bank wondering where they'd gone. And then it happened. Angie Chi's baby started to cry. Angie Chi lived to be more than 100 years old. And she would often tell the children at Washakie, the Shoshone community years later, of jumping into this frozen river with her newborn, of tending the seven bullet wounds that she'd already had to her body. And then she'd tell the children how she had to drown her own baby to make sure that she didn't give up the location for the other women. The cruelest killing though, was that of bear hunter. 
they knew that he was a leader. They'd shot him, they'd stabbed him, they'd tortured him and kicked him and whipped him in many different ways. Through all of that, the old chief wouldn't die and he wouldn't even cry out for mercy. Because he wouldn't, the soldiers became frustrated and angry. One of the military men took his rifle and heated that bayonet until it was glowing red. They ran that hot piece of metal through that chief's head from ear to ear. Bear Hunter went to his grave, a man of honor, and he left behind a wife and many small children. At the end of the massacre, Connor allowed a handful of saints to walk the killing field. James Martineau, a local pioneer, was sickened by what he saw. In his journal, he wrote that many of the squaws were killed because they would not lie down and submit to be ravished. He later told Peter Mon sickening accounts of inhuman acts by the soldiers. He said after the Indians had been routed, they killed all of the wounded by hitting them in the head with an ax. The next morning at the request of Brigham Young, three locals, William Head, William Nelson, and William Hole, went to the massacre site to one, count the dead, and the two, look for survivors. Hole later recorded in his journal. You gotta love the Mormons for keeping journals. We have all this info now. Hole put in his journal though, we drove our sleighs as far as the river. The first sight to greet us was an old man walking, head bowed, arms folded, lamenting the dead. He didn't speak to us and headed north. Then he said, never will I forget the scene. Dead bodies were everywhere. There were eight deep in one place and three to five deep in most places. All in all, the three of us counted more than 450 dead. Two thirds of that number being women and children. He went on to say, we found two Indian little boys alive and one little girl. The little girl looked to be about three years of old but she was badly wounded, having received eight bullet wounds to her tiny body. We took them on our sleighs to made them as comfortable as possible. At this time, I can't imagine, the Sagwitch must have realized that he was now living in two different worlds. One group was greedy, wanted everything, especially the land. The other group only wanted to live and travel as they'd always done. One group made their wishes and dreams come true by making themselves the conqueror at the expense of a defenseless people who only wanted to be left alone. Manifest destiny was now realized. Ralph Smith, an area settler, Mormon, summed up the sediments of the local saints when he said this in his journal, we looked upon the massacre as gruesome, but necessary. And then added the work of Patrick Edward Connor and his soldiers was nothing less than an intervention from our heavenly father. Marianne Weston Mon, wife of Peter Mon, wrote in her journal, the residents of Cache Valley regarded Connor's efforts as an imposition of providence in our behalf and commented that the Indians had been a source of so much trouble that patience had ceased to be a virtue. Henry Ballard, Bishop of the Logan First Ward said in his journal, this put a quietus upon the Indians. The Lord raised up his foe in Colonel Connor to punish them without us having to do it. We had borrowed a great deal from them, and still we had been feeding them. And yet some of the wicked spirits among them would stir up trouble against us. George Farrell, 
Secretary of the Logan Second Ward recorded in the official church minutes. We, the people of Cache Valley, looked upon the movement of Colonel Connor as an intervention from the Almighty God, as the Indians had been a source of great annoyance to us for a long time. And finally, in a letter to Brigham Young from Peter Mon, dated February 4th, Mon said, I feel my skirts rid of their blood. They rejected the way of life and salvation, which had been pointed out to them from time to time. And thus they have perished, relying upon their own strength and wisdom. Just north of Preston, Idaho today, you'll find an old monument just off of Highway 91. This monument was erected in 1932 by the people of Franklin County. It was meant to tell this story of the events of that fateful day. It was a celebrated event. Everybody came together to share their history and talk about what happened. Scout troops, political leaders, church leaders. What the monument really accomplished for me is that it gives people a reason to forget. That monument strips us of our obligation to find out for ourselves what took place. And that monument tells us how it wants the past to be remembered. You see, humans have great memories for what we want to remember. In commemorating something like this, the battle, you tend to forget the uglier parts of history and you only focus on the heroism of the soldier and the saint. That's the kind of daughters of Utah Pioneers Monument that's there today. But you know what? That narrative now becomes the story. It's not a story about my people. It becomes a story about the brave soldiers and the wonderful pioneer women who took care of them at the conclusion. In constructing this monument, you firm up memory and you create what I call a false history. You decide. The plaque on the monument says, attacks by the Indians on the peaceful inhabitants in this vicinity led to the final battle here on January 29th in 1863. The conflict occurred in deep snow and bitter cold. Scores of wounded soldiers were taken from the battlefield to the Latter-day Saint community of Franklin, Idaho. Here, pioneer women trained through trials and necessities of frontier living accepted the responsibility of caring for the wounded soldiers until they could be removed to Camp Douglas, Utah. Oh, and by the way, two Indian women found alive after the encounter were given homes in Franklin. So my question is, is this really what happened? The problem with that narrative for me is that it gives us one point of view from one generation's perspective. 69 years after the actual event. It's like a view from a window that's been carefully placed to exclude a whole quadrant of a beautiful landscape. You only get to see what they want you to see. It reinforces the view that Indians are savages and it labeled our women and children as enemy combatants. It reinforces the view that violence on the frontier was necessary for the survival of Mormon communities. And it showed what the consequences would be if both groups tried to share the same space. This May, I was there at the monument with a group of fourth graders from an elementary school. There's a tree hanging next to this monument that people leave gifts in, dream catchers and all kinds of different things. And I tell the kids, people leave things as an offering to those who died that day. Well, one fourth grade boy looked in the tree and said, 
I see a mirror hanging in the tree. What do you think that means? I was frantically trying to come up with a good answer when a young girl next to me bailed me out. And she said, I know what that means. It is there to remind us that we did this. We did this. I was taught that day by a young fourth grader. What if the plaque on that monument would have been written from the perspective of the Shoshone people? Would it have read the same way? Maybe it would have said something like this. The massacre of the Northwestern Band of Shoshone Nation occurred in this vicinity on January 29th in 1863. Colonel Patrick Edward Connor and his California volunteers from Camp Douglas, Utah, attacked a sleeping Indian village in the early morning hours of the day. The soldiers shot, raped, bludgeoned, bayoneted several hundred men, women, and children to their death. The Indians fought back with the limited weapons available to them, but the band was all but annihilated. So which version of the massacre is correct? The answer will lie in your perspective. The events that took place on that cold January morning have long been forgotten by most, if you've even heard of it at all. Maybe guilt or remorse has silenced all those who one day may have wanted to know the truth. But I think there's a new generation of people that have a desire to listen and to learn. And you know what? It's not because we're looking to have things made right. We're not. But I believe that those who died at Bear River that day have a God-given right to be heard. Their voice, their voices speak to me from the dust. We remember and we honor the past because it allows us to succeed in the future. The most successful Native Americans today are those who can best balance culture and change. We honor our culture. We honor those who went before. They are important to us. We honor them in their traditions. But as a tribal leader, I believe that we live in an ever-changing world, and I need to prepare our youth to change and succeed with it. The massacre at Bo Ogai has taught me many lessons over the years. It has taught me that bad things happen to people. But how we respond to those events will determine our character and who we become. It has taught me to offer unconditional forgiveness, but it doesn't mean you need to forget. It's taught me that as we preserve history, it's important that all views are represented and respected. It has taught me that everyone has a story worthy of being told. What is your story going to be? Because your story is equally as important as mine. It has taught me also that the souls of my ancestors peer out from behind my mask of skin and that through my memories, they get to live again. Tell me a fact and I will learn. Tell me a truth and I will believe. But tell me a story and that will live in my heart forever. You know, ultimately the story of Bear River is our story. But in some ways, I hope you can respect the story that we want to have told, as well as recognize your role within that story. History doesn't always affirm us. Sometimes history challenges us to think about an uglier past that we'd rather not have. But you know what? That's really the power and the benefit of history. It connects us to the past. It connects us to our humanity and our inhumanity. But it offers us a way to move forward, especially in a circumstance like this with the Shoshone people 
moving forward in a way that connects us, not in the prettiest of ways, but to move forward to a new relationship that I call a 21st century relationship based on respect. Respect for the truth and what happened in that past moment. Then, and only then, do you get the possibility for reconciliation. But how do we make reconciliation possible in a seemingly divided world where our Western values teach us that we all have individual rights, teach us to use the land for extraction and depletion versus indigenous values that teach us that we all have obligations, obligations to the past, obligations to the present and obligations to the future obligations to our community. You know, the Iroquois nation, their leadership, they don't make any decisions without considering what effects that decision would have on seven generations ahead. Think about the implications for our future if our leaders govern that way. Before we leave, take a look around you tonight. We're as varied and as beautiful as a whole field of wildflowers, each bringing with us our own individual characteristics and traits. As you look around, I hope you can truly see the beauty in what I see. We need to be able to look at each other through each other's eyes. When this happens, the possibilities of collaborations are endless. I believe the differences that we all bring to the table can be the strengths that we all draw from each other. You know, our life has brought us knowledge. Knowledge brings understanding. And greater understanding brings openness to other ways of seeing and being. Don't ever be afraid to forge a new path. It's important to remember that nobody is you and that is your superpower. Be the one who celebrates the different colors of our skins and embraces the opportunity that gives us to learn from each other. Be the one who breaks the cycle. If you were ever judged wrongly, choose to be understanding. If you were ever rejected, choose acceptance. If you were ever shamed, be the one who chooses compassion. Be the person you needed when things didn't go your way and not the person that was hurting you. And always, instead of holding on to a grudge, be the first one to forgive. I think about the values of my Native American brothers and sisters and what lessons they can teach us today. I believe they would want us all to live as one to cherish our likenesses, but celebrate the heck out of our differences, to honor our stewardship for this earth and all things that live on it and the sky above it. They would tell us to have gratitude for what we have and for those who made the trails for us to follow. And they would tell us to have reverence in our hearts. They would tell us to spread the kind of love that awakens the soul that makes each one of us reach for more, that plants the fire in our hearts and brings peace to our minds. That's the kind of love this world needs today. Love, kindness, forgiveness, acceptance. I see you, I hear you, and I accept you. Those affirmations and many more like them are what I call medicine words. I hope we can speak medicine words to those people in our circle, but especially to our youth. Words that bless, power, empower, and inspire. When we speak medicine words, we build unity and we strengthen our culture and we strengthen our communities. One day a young girl asked me after a presentation I gave to second graders, how did you get to be the chief? And I told her this, 
When a young Shoshone boy or girl does an act of kindness or service, the chief in the tribe would give that boy or girl an eagle feather. I then said to her, what do you think would happen if that boy or girl kept doing kind things? She said, well, they'd get more eagle feathers. I said, well, what if that boy or girl kept doing kind things until they became an adult? What do you think would happen then? And she said, well, by then they would have so many eagle feathers. And I said, you're right. And then one day when the chief gets ready to die and the chief is always the chief until he dies, he'll call everyone together and he'll say, I'm about to meet my creator. I need to select a new chief. I want all of you to pull out your eagle feathers and show them to me. And then I told this girl, it was a person that had the most eagle feathers would be the new chief. You see, the chief isn't the toughest or the bravest or the strongest. The chief is one who led a life of service and kindness to those around him or her. So I tell the kids, go be a chief. You're probably not going to be a Shoshone chief. But if you live your life that way, being a good sibling, expressing gratitude for those around you, being a good friend, you will become a leader in your community. You will become someone that people want to be with. Leadership that is rooted not in power and authority, but in service and wisdom. You know, in 2018, we were able to purchase all of the Bear River Massacre site, 700 acres. I raised $2 million to do that. That just begun to allow our people to heal. Nobody was ever buried that day. Those bodies are still there. I wanted to build an interpretive center on the site and I'm raising money to do so. But as much as telling the story of the people is important, it's equally as important to tell the story of the land. And we're doing that. We're restoring the land to what it looked like in 1863 using my grandmother's plant diary as a guide. Voices that have been quiet for more than a century and a half are now being heard. You see, the Bear River Massacre is not just a Shoshone tragedy. It's an American tragedy. But in the Shoshone response to that event, there are tools that can help us heal the divides that take place in our modern society. As the story of the massacre and its ramifications becomes better known, people can more fully recognize the significance in the experience of others. Their empathy and understanding will grow as they see ways to forgive, to integrate and flourish while protecting your own unique values. As visitors are engaged, I hope they will feel the echoes of the past, helping them come to term with current choices that we're all making here in the future. Let me close by sharing with you the prophecy of Crazy Horse. You've all heard of him. They're doing a monument close to in South Dakota. Crazy Horse was awesome. And he had a prophecy, he had a dream right before he died. And you tell me if this isn't today. He said, upon suffering beyond suffering, the red nation shall rise again and it shall be a blessing to a sick world. A world filled with broken promises and selfishness and separations. A world longing for light again. <laughs> I see a time of seven generations when all the colors of mankind will come together under the sacred tree of life and the whole earth will become one circle again. In that day, there will be those among the native people who will carry this knowledge and understanding of unity among all living things. And the young white ones will come to those of my people and ask for this wisdom. 
I salute the light in your eyes where the whole universe dwells. For when you are at the center within you, and I am in that place within me, we shall be as one. I think the words of Crazy Horse are prophetic. Like many Native American leaders who went before, and who I believe many Native American leaders who will come again. We're ever going to have a chance to save this world. I believe we're going to have to need this wisdom. Thank you for having me tonight. Thank you. Questions. Anybody have any questions? I didn't leave a lot of time for questions, but. Yeah, we'll be happy to come around at this time to collect your questions. Be kind, people. Thank you. Any others? Just hold them up, if you would, please. Thank you. Do you want to just read them? Sure. Or do you want? Yeah. You kind of well, filter through. Yeah. So thank you so much, Mr. Perry, for sharing this story with us, um, an incredibly difficult story uh, and a deeply personal story. Thank you. And when I first started this, this job, I heard Mr. Perry speak in January of this year, and I knew that Boise needed to hear this story again. And I just want to thank you for committing yourself to sharing this story. Um, and it's remarkable to me that the story of an unspeakable atrocity that took place in our past has become, through your telling, a, thank you, a, a hopeful story, right? Mm -hmm. And I think that's something that's incredibly important and something that I find most impactful about your story. <laughs> Will you run for president? That's the first one we got. <laughs> I ran Thanks. for Congress in Utah two years ago in the first district, so all of Northern Utah, probably in the most conservative district. Now, it runs the Democrats, so you can kind of guess how that turned out for me. But I was able to bring out a lot of things and talk about a lot of issues that are dear to my heart, but it was brutal. And she back there will not let me run again, that wife of mine. So somebody asked me to run for the mayor of the city and she's in the background going, Nope, he's not running for anything. It's pretty tough on your family because they say things about you that are not true. And how do you really combat it? So this is a good one here, uh, Mr. Perry, because I actually had a, a similar question. Oh, call me Darren. Uh, Mr. Perry sounds so dang old. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Darren, please share more what is happening at the site now. Interpretive signs, replanting, are there opportunities to volunteer? Yes, How there to are. to donate? Yeah, there's opportunities to volunteer. Um, I'm raising money for the brick and mortar building. It's an 8,000 square foot interpretive center. I've raised about 5 million. The construction costs have gone crazy. So hope they'll come down a little bit. We've received 6.6 .6 million in land restoration money because there's a lot of grant money for land restoration and water. Uh, I did a lecture a few months ago, healing the Bear River, healing the Great Salt Lake, because where I live, the Great Salt Lake's going away and it's gonna be a problem. And I talked about what we're doing at Bear River with cleaning up the watershed to a point that we're going to restore the Bonneville cutthroat trout in this fishery what we're doing, taking out a half a million Russian olives that hold up to 70 gallons of water each. And by cleaning up these watersheds, we're putting more water into the Bear River, which hopefully will make it to the Great Salt Lake. Uh, this spring, there will be opportunities to plant new cottonwoods and willows, and uh, you can get a hold of me to, if you wanna get on a list, you can come down. Um, so yeah, we're doing a lot of restoration work at the site. The building will get built when I get all the money raised. I'm tired of raising money. You can donate and maybe you can share a link with the city. I'll give you that, but it's boaogai.org, B-O-A, 
O-G-O-I.org. That's a secure website. It'll give you more pictures, more history, stories, and there's a secured link that you can donate online from there. And then what you can really do though, the state of Utah gave us almost a million dollars. The LDS church gave us a sizable chunk. I guilted the heck out of them when I met with them. <laughs> we haven't received anything from the state of Idaho. And I've been trying to meet with legislators and lawmakers, and maybe you can just lobby them a little bit and say, you know what? The state of Utah almost gave a million dollars to a project in Idaho. Can you help these guys out? And so I did talk to the governor and we're good friends. And, and he said, well, if I give you guys money, you're not an Idaho tribe. But you know what, back in the day we were, there wasn't a boundary. We were a Utah Idaho tribe, we're right on the border. And so our history is here in Idaho. And he just said, the other tribes will get really mad at me if we start funding a Utah tribe. And I'm going, the project's in Idaho. The largest massacre of Native Americans is in your state. You would think you would want to be a part of it. And I'm holding out hope that they'll do the right thing. I'm not going to give up yet. Yeah. It's and tough for me to get up here, though, from Logan all the time and to lobby as much as I should. So that actually ties into a question uh, from the audience. Has Idaho contributed to preserving the Shoshone yeah. narrative and the place itself? You touched on the place itself there, the site, but has Idaho contributed to preserving the Shoshone narrative? Not as much as I'd like them to, although at the museum, they did that beautiful wing for the Native Americans. We got one little wall that talks about the story of our people. But Jan Gallimore and the historic preservation people of Idaho have been awesome. They come and support us every year. Next Saturday, bring your kids to the museum. I'm making bear claw necklaces and telling the kids stories at noon uh, next Saturday. So I'll be back to Boise. I love this town, by the way. <laughs> you find me a job here, I'm coming back here. <laughs> but that's how much I like it. We're coming back next weekend too. Great. But I get a lot of love and support here. I actually won a big award here called the Esto Perpetua Award mm -hmm. for one that promotes history in the state of Idaho. Three or four years ago, I got awarded that award. And I'm the only Utah that ever got awarded the guy that promotes history in Idaho the most. So my heart's here, I promise. Now, Darren, you talked um, about this historical marker, right? And this question ties into historical markers, monuments, and that whole debate, right? Um, it asks, you know, what agency or, or who generally controls the narratives on historic roadside signs? And we could extend that to memorials, right? Yeah, historic yeah. sites, interpretive signs, things of that nature. And who can one contact to push for a more truthful and balanced story? And I, that tied into a question that I had too, is that what can Boiseans do? What can folks in this room do? Well, let me answer the first part why I'm thinking about how to answer the second part. Sure. Uh, memorials, I mean, when Churchill said it's only written, history is only written by the victors. He could have said unmemorialized by the victors because that's the narrative we get on all these historical markers. and. That one just happens to be the Daughters of Utah Pioneers Monument. We don't own it, we can't change it, but every year we'd have a commemoration there. And for the next two weeks, they got hate mail and hate calls because people read the monument and then really attack them for how crappy it is. And then they'll call me and say, what do you think we should do? And should we take down the plaque? Should we, and I said, because look, I'm not a monument eraser per se. I think there's some horrific monuments in the South that probably should come down. I think it's a case by case basis. That one isn't so horrific that it needs to be erased forever. I said, why don't we put up another plaque on the monument that accurately tells what happened? Leave up your plaque, give people a historical perspective of were they really that bad 170 years ago? And versus today, have we made any progress? 
And so actually two years ago, they did in 2019, I unveiled a new plaque on that monument. They didn't take down their old one. They left it up there, but on the back side of that uh, monument is a new plaque. And they came up with a bunch of flowery things to go on that plaque, but the first sentence says it all. Here in this vicinity, more than 400 Shoshones were brutally massacred by the US Army. So it didn't matter what it said after that. Because if you go there, you'll kind of get that, you know. But I think we just need to be vigilant and get involved in our local communities. And when we see something that doesn't look right or ask questions, I think there's a process we can go through. Uh, it's like I tell schools that have bad mascots, get a community group together and talk about it and make a decision as a community because it's a community thing we need to and you have a voice you can change things and so my grandmother you know that place used to be called the battle of bear river the national park service called it battle of bear river mm -hmm. she went to washington dc more than 10 times and testified in congress and because of her in 1990 they changed the designation of the bear river massacre one person, one woman of color made a difference because she spoke up. And I think as a community, that's what you do. And this community, I love it because it's a little more progressive than where I live. And so I know, cause I can see all the Trump flag signs in my hood, so. But I, I love it here and I, we all have a voice and let's just use our voice if we see something that we don't like, see if we can make a change. Great. Thank you for that. Um, this is a, there's a couple that came in online and I'll read these if I may. This one, this one's not a question, um, but this individual says, as one of the descendants of the Mormon settlers in the Bear Valley, I want to say how much I appreciated hearing the missing side of the story and definitely intend to donate to your goal. So I wanted to okay. share that. That's nice. Did it take you a long time, maybe by way of closing, did it take you a long time to come to your expansive view of history? Kind of, it's evolved. I was a little more snot nose and, <laughs> but you know what? My grandmother was an activist her whole life. She was angry. She was angry at the church. She was angry at everybody. And she was an activist that pushed back and she'd hit you over the head with it. And rightfully so. She heard the stories from her grandfather who was 12 and survived. She'd been to the site with him and he showed her where the dead bodies were and they're still there. So her perspective was different, but it's not my perspective. I'll probably take you to the edge of being very uncomfortable and sad about it and emotional. But for me, it's more about, we're all gonna go through those tough times. What can we do together though to make this world a better place? And that's where I like to take it and leave it. And I've, I've been well received because of it, because you don't want to be hit over the head with it every day, all day, and say you owe me for the atrocities of your relatives. That doesn't do any of us any good. Let's solve the issues. Let's, let's work together and make this world a better place. So, but let's use stories like this to learn from and, and hopefully grow from so we don't do it again. Well, thank you. Thank you so much, Mr. Perry. Thanks for coming, everyone. I'll stick around for a few minutes if you want to talk. If you want to buy a book, they're $10. You don't have $10 and you want a book, just give them a book. Okay. And I have to get my book signed. <laughs> Uh, thank you all for attending tonight. Be sure to join us on uh, the 2nd of February when we'll hear from Professor Lisa McLean and Rachel Taylor from Boise State University on Out in Idaho, Queer Spaces Beyond Boise. Uh, thank you all so much. Thank you so much, Darren. And um, get home safe. Have a wonderful evening, everyone. Thank you again.